what's up guys welcome back to Carson's IH garage today we're going to be doing a quick tune on the Scout 152 motor I just showed a video on how to uh, bleed your cooling system and that was just a real quick video so this one's gonna be a little more in-depth for those of you who don't know how to tune to the vacuum gauge uh, and everything like that I'm very new to this this is gonna be only the second time that I've ever done it uh, and in this video we're gonna go over how to read the vacuum gauge, how to look for vacuum, how to adjust your timing with a vacuum, how to read your spark plugs for lean and rich, and also a couple other tips and tricks when uh, using a vacuum gauge and wanting to tune your engine. So let's get started. All right, so the first thing is I got my vacuum gauge here. This is a cheapie from Harbor Freight, but as long as you have one that seems pretty accurate, uh, you should be all right. And uh, it doesn't even matter how accurate it is, as a matter of fact, just that you could get the most out of the gauge. So your goal would be to get up in these higher numbers here. So as high of a reading as you can get it is ideally what you want. So you could measure literally anything. It could say 20 and only be measuring 15. Granted, you won't have a good idea of the condition of your motor, but if you had just rebuilt your motor and you know it's really nice, then there's darn chickens behind me squawking today. Then you could, will know that, uh, you know that your motor is good and you could from there be able to tune your um, air fuel mixture and your, your idle screws and stuff like that. So this is just the kit from Harbor Freight. It's literally called a fuel pump and vacuum gauge tester. It's from a, it's a, you know, the Pittsburgh uh, automotive series line, whatever. And all I do is have my vacuum line and run into manifold vacuum there. You don't want to run the vacuum off of, say, where your, uh, you know, where your distributor would get its, uh, would get its vacuum from, because you don't want to measure from vacuum advance, because that's technically a restriction. So you're not going to see the, the full vacuum that you would as if you did it right there. So you know, obviously, here's my intake manifold here. This whole this whole thing here, and then there's an, a nipple in, and then and then a line. And then I have my vacuum hose running directly from that. And then I just hung it on this cross support on my hood. Uh, so, and then I have uh, my new set of four spark plugs. These are correct for the, my engine. What I'm gonna do before I install these is put a little anti-seize in, but I'm gonna do it after I run it. So it'll just, it'll utilize the fresh plugs right away rather than go through rich lean, rich lean, and maybe possibly following them out. Because the ones in here are still rather good, but I like to replace them since I don't know how many miles I've been put on these plugs. So I have a fan blowing, I have the garage door open, vent some of the fumes. I'm gonna grab a flathead screwdriver to adjust my uh, air fuel ratio. And real quick, this is a Holley 1904 carburetor. This is the single barrel deal. And right there, if it can focus for me. Right there, there you go. Right there is your uh, air fuel ratio. And so you're gonna see the vacuum measurement change as I twist that. And you wanna get the highest vacuum possible. So you're gonna start with your air fuel ratio to get the most out of that. Then you're gonna move to your timing in your distributor gonna loosen the hole down you're gonna either advance or retard the timing to see what you can get out of it and then once you have your max set from there you drop down your idle speed to and I think this calls for around 850 900 rpm so I don't have a, a tack anywhere I don't have one in, in the truck and I don't have a yeah like a, a handy uh, little battery op tack so I'll just kind of dial it in to where it seems like it'll idle good it sounds good and it's not going to die out on me at a stoplight if it or if it was you know under load and I, I put it in gear and I'm holding the brake uh, that it's not going to uh, cut it out so knowing all this and knowing what we're gonna do I'll start by starting the motor and we'll see what our initial vacuum is and I'll grab a screwdriver and I'll bring you guys along so another thing too I told you before, here is my uh, idle mixture here. 
what you want to do is you want to fully bottom this out. You don't really want to put a torque on it just till it, it stops. It might be a little rusty, so it might not be a bad idea to pull it out completely. Give it a quick run on the uh, the bench grinder, not not on the grinding wheel, but on the wire wheel if you have one, or clean it up a little wire brush, maybe some sandpaper, so it glides nice and smooth in there. I wouldn't put any lubricant on it. I would just want the brass to, to slide right in there. And all you do is bottom it out, and then from there, you rotate out counterclockwise, so you, you spin it lefty-loosey, so you, you go in righty-tighty to bottom it out, and then lefty Lucy about one and a half to two turns. I like to start on the one and a half in the lower range just in case it ever wants to go down some. So I'll start at a, at, a, at my zero here. This is my new zero. And from there, I'll either have to turn it out, which is most likely what's gonna happen, or turn it in. But I'm gonna start at one and a half. Again, I've never tuned this engine. I'm gonna start it on maybe about 21 inches of vacuum. That's really good for this motor and how old this is. I don't think this thing has ever been rebuilt. It's already idling nice. Uh, it's not noisy. I'm just happy to talk loudly so you guys can hear me. Uh, but 21 looks really good. I'm gonna turn on things a little bit and we'll see how it changes around. So when turning on stuff, you don't wanna radically change stuff and expect your motor to respond. Give it a second and see what it does. So there it looks like we're at 22. We'll go for a little bit more here. Doing like a quarter turn at a time. Looks like 22 again. So I'm gonna hold you guys up here the best I can. While I turn on this. So I got my screwdriver on the screw. Let's see how much it changes. So there seems to be a fine line here. I don't know if I can focus in on it, but it's right at 22. And so I'm screwing it in. I think I'm bridging it up, I think. Maybe leaning it out, I forget. And you can see it start to go on its way to 23. And if I screw it out, ah, you see the needle berries again. So, there we go. Okay, so there's a change there. Out, a little bit more. Go back in to dial it in. Alright, I think we're there. We're right at 22 inches of vacuum. That's really rather good for this engine. I'm quite surprised myself. Uh, if I give it a couple of revs, see how it sounds, see how it responds. So that's really good. So now we'll work on timing. Alright, so let's talk about timing on this motor. We already got it dialed in about 22 and a half inches of vacuum. Uh, inches of mercury vacuum is what it's measured in, which is really good. Uh, that's about 53 centimeters of mercury uh, for those of you in the metric system. And that's really good for a motor. Uh, on the gauge, it indicates that it's a normal motor. Grant, granted, I wouldn't trust that, really, because this is a $22 Harbor Freight gauge. But it does seem to work pretty nice, and I'm quite happy with uh, with how well this, this turned out. So before, this was running really rich, and I'm glad I got that dialed in. So going back to timing, I have my uh, timing hole down strapped there. And all I'm gonna do is loosen that about three quarters of a turn to, you know, half, whatever, half a turn, just enough to get it loose. But you don't want it dangling freely in the block. You don't wanna like, 
have it to where like if the wind blows it's it's going to move the distributor you want to have it have some force required to move that distributor so a good way to check it is if you can grab the the cap here and rotate it uh or you ideally you'd probably want two hands but see if you could ideally if you could just nudge it with some control that's ideally where you want to be so i nudged it a little bit but i put it back to where it was we're going to start the motor and we're going to either going to advance it or retard it so let's talk about that because i was confused when i first started to learn about this stuff so retarding is that it's firing late so this rotor on the inside there's a little rotor that delivers a spark to each one of these wires and it gets its main power from its coil wire here and delivered to each one of these little points and there's four of them because there's four cylinders so that rotor is going to be spinning clockwise and these wires are or what and these order of these wires determine the firing order now the firing order for this motor is one three four two so that means the first cylinder is going to fire then the third one then the fourth then the first so you know if it, you could do a little more research uh and find a better resource than what i would be but always on a distributor they have the number one spark plug marked so actually this is number or the number one cylinder marked so this is one so this is going to be one three four and two again this is a scout 152 motor also known as the comanche 152 motor it was used quite a bit in a lot of internationals for a lot of years and it's a very good motor it makes a lot uh probably about 130 foot pounds of torque uh and about 93 90 ish horsepower uh but probably with the you know the the air filter and, and restrictive exhaust it's got on it probably 85 or so but it's not a fire breather but it'll get you where you need to go and it's a great little motor as you saw so when moving your distributor and talking about retarding and being late uh obviously not using retard in an offensive way but the definition of it is to be late and as far as the timing aspect is when that rotor is spinning that rotor spins in relation to how far up that piston is in it, the, like the cylinder. So it's the height of the piston in the cylinder. So, you know, say in a perfect world, uh, you know, where physics doesn't exist uh, and, and, you know, chemistry doesn't exist, you know, you could be so far off as to have your spark plug be firing when you're piston is only halfway up its, its cylinder up up its bore there so ideally you want to know your uh, your engine's uh, timing curve so you know what that means is you want to know how many degrees before or even after top dead center your engine is going to be firing so i don't know what this one's going to be like but i know uh the 304 v8s which is basically two of these put together this is a 152 a 304 half of 304 is 152 it's about eight or nine degrees even 10 degrees i've seen you know uh differing opinions in it but about eight or nine degrees of total timing and so that's what I'm, I'm i'm gonna go with here i don't have a timing light but my goal is to show you how to do it with a vacuum gauge because my pulley my dampener oops, whoopsie my dampener doesn't have timing marks on it and I don't want to put timing marks on it I don't want to spend the time to put timing marks on it I'm just going to do it with my vacuum gauge so firing late basically what it boils down to is that you're it's exactly what it sounds like your spark plug is firing too late than what would be liked than what would be in, you know appreciated by the engine than what would make it run good so it'll be firing late so as far as advance the timing, people are saying like, oh, advance the timing for horsepower. And it's true. You can get a little more horsepower, a little more RPM out of advanced timing. And what you're going to do there is you're going to make the spark plug fire uh, a little bit later, which is going to have your engine have to compress those gases more and have to run a little bit hotter because, you know, uh, combustion creates heat. Uh, and so you're going to make it run a little bit hotter, a little bit harder by advancing the timing. 
So what we're looking for here when we do the vacuum gauge and we advance or retard our timing depending on where it is already. I'm not sure where it is. I haven't done this before. You're seeing firsthand what, what I'm doing with the, the tuning on this. <clears throat> You're, um... You're going to want to achieve the highest inches or centimeters of mercury for vacuum reading. Uh, and you're going to want to keep it there. Maybe dial it back an inch or so, maybe a half an inch. Um, just so it kind of sits in that place. Like you don't want to overrun your engine. You don't want to like have it so advanced or so retarded that it doesn't like it. You don't want to have it at the, at the extremes. You want to have it somewhere in the middle. And that's ideally one... Uh, half to one inches of vacuum off from its highest reading i'm going to see where it is and depending on where it is i might leave it at its highest reading to let it run good and the but, battery died on the scout there might be a draw somewhere i don't know i'll have to figure it out but i'm not concerned the battery just sucks it's like an ever start one more piece of junk so i want to just talk about readings on the vacuum gauge so you can see uh bottom there it says normal motor that's right we were we were running the end of the green zone and um and you know, over here it says uh late valve timing or leak at the intake manifold uh late lightning timing or late ing timing and then uh fuel gauge there and you this is every vacuum gauge is uh is most likely also a, a fuel pressure gauge so you notice you're at 22 and a half yeah the 22 and a half inches of vacuum uh or about you know 57 uh centimeters of mercury uh there also inches of mercury is what, what it's measured into but notice the needle was nice and steady like i was able to, to dial into that measurement really really close there and it's a you know and it says at the bottom there too it says uh hand should remain steady in green zone well you know it should be remaining steady and what that tells you is that your motor is not struggling to find where it wants to sit so you know i was able to dial in my idle kind of right away it only wanted that about one and a half to two turns uh two and a quarter turns out for it to be nice and steady so this motor is running really well right now and that's all it really needed was for me to start back at my zero mark which is only one and a half turns out in order to get it the fuel that it needs to even run and it stayed right at 22 and a half and i could let this thing idle probably all day with enough gas granted um and it would probably remain at 22 and a half you know this gauge is actually pretty helpful because it says uh you know um a steady drop to zero indicates a, a choked muffler so if this started at 22 and a half on, in my case and it slowly dropped down to, to zero you know you have a, a choking muffler uh there's really a lot you could determine with a vacuum gauge and i'm only really touching upon the few key things that people mainly use it for you know if you have a, a dead cylinder you could diagnose it so like down here at the uh at the distributor if you know that your motor is good at 22 and a half inches vacuum then you can unplug a cylinder and watch the vacuum gauge drop like an inch or so of, of mercury or a couple or a 1.54 uh, centimeters of mercury. Um, and that's only if you know that your motor's good. You know, if you think you have a misfire, you could test it and know for sure. All right, so just like before, I have my vacuum gauge set up. And so the timing dropped a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is dial a little bit in here just by rotating the distributor. And we're gonna watch that vacuum gauge change around a little bit. there it runs like not as good but as you see when we're advancing it the idle is getting healthier and we're actually seeing more inches of vacuum so there you go the needle's not as steady now it's bouncing around Going back up. Trying to find its spot there. Doesn't like 
that. So right there, we're at 22. So now I'm going to reach back and I'm going to adjust my mixture a little bit more. Alright, so I'm going to bring my mixture out. So there's that 22 and a half we were seeing before. I'm going to bump my timing around a little bit more. Alright. So it kind of bucked a little bit there. I'm gonna go mid-range. See if the needle will steady out. I'm gonna give it a few revs here. I'm going to start touching my idle mixture a little bit more again. Alright, and I'm going to watch that. And I'll bring you guys back in about 2-3 minutes. And we'll see how she's idling. I stopped the motor a couple seconds ago to lock down that distributor. And you see we're nice and steady at 22 and a half inches of vacuum. See it right there. Of course, the needle's gonna jump around a little bit. That's because the engine's firing. And they like that. All right, so now we're gonna talk about spark plugs here. Um, I got all four of them pulled. This is sailing number one, two, three, and four, going across just like they came out of the motor there. So basically, on all of them, you could see that uh, the tip is a light gray frosting. Um, and it's not really sooty and it's dry. That is exactly what you want. You want a light gray to a, a rather darker gray soot on all of these and that'll indicate that your motor is running perfect, that your air fuel ratio is perfect, that you're not too lean or too rich. So what would that look like? So too rich would be um, that your plug is really sooty it might even be wet from gasoline. If you smell it, it smells like gasoline. Um, or it might just be a very, very dark color. So now too lean would be like, it would look like a brand new plug. Obviously, you know it's been running in the engine for quite a while. Um, but it would be very, very clean. So, you know, that's something to look out for. So richer lean, but we seem to be right there. So I'm going to go ahead and replace these even though they probably don't have a lot of miles on it. They're just dirty and gross looking. And also I want to start fresh. Not that you can't clean these, but I have the new plugs. They're NGKs versus these Champions. Um, I've used NGKs before and I think they're really good. And those are the Iridium plugs. I got them on sale. So it was a no-brainer. But they all look like that. Um, that. That nice gray. None of them have oil on them. If they had oil... It'd be a very wet plug, almost as if it were rich, but if you smell it, it doesn't smell like gasoline, and you kind of rub your finger on the, the electrode here, uh, and you felt, you know, and you rubbed it around, you can feel that it's oil. All of these are fine. They were just a little bit dirtier and greasy on the outside um, from before. But now that the motor's all cleaned up, I'll throw those new one in, ones in. It's a good idea to put a little anti-seize on these threads to make sure they don't get stuck, even if they have these little uh, crush washers on there and uh, throw a little bit of dielectric grease on the on the tip to make sure it's making good contact at all times. So even if it does rattle around and your spark plug boot isn't quite tight enough, it'll still make good contact. So one interesting thing too, um, if spark plugs don't have these little crush washers here, then you'll have to, once they're snug, you only have to do a 16th of a turn. If they have these crush washers, you could do anywhere from a half a turn up to a three quarters of a turn after they're snugged down. Uh, there's obviously um, correct torque specifications that I will look up once I install mine. 
uh, and, I'll, and, and if there are available, I will use them. If not, the sixteenth of a turn for the non-washer, or half to three-quarter turn with the for the ones with the washer, is always a good rule of thumb when it comes to doing spark plugs. Again, anti-seize, dielectric grease, and then the turns, and then you also want to look at your gap. So you, uh, I have a little gapping coin, just a little cheap keychain thing from AutoZone, and all you do is it, it looks like a, a a half dollar and it's got a progressive slope on it as you go around so that you can measure gaps so you slide um, slide it in between here and it'll tell you what your gap is uh, and I already pre-gapped my new plugs over there to around 40 thousands um, and I just did that just so the gap would be wider and I get a little bit better burn uh, and you could do little tricks like that to make sure your engine runs good but this engine already runs good as it is with this gap in it, and so I'll just kind of compare the gap side by side before I install these. And I'll install them off camera just because we've all seen spark plugs get installed. Um, and it is really straightforward. Take a spark plug out, put any C's, do the gap thing, um, dielectric grease, crush washer with the uh, half turn, dark specification like I said, put the boot back on, move on to the next one. You don't want to take them all out kind of like I did, although I know my firing order. And I could easily put it back together, just like I did when I rebuilt the, the motor. So, that's basically it. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to comment or email me. Uh, thanks for watching this episode of Carson's IH Garage. Till next time, see ya.